Hey class, welcome to chapter 12, section 2, looking at expanding communication and the rise of industry and factories in America. Again, we're looking at new developments, new inventions that were changing American life. Now, America had a postal service as far back as 1639. Crazy, right? 1620, the pilgrims came. 1639, we had some form of railroad of... Uh, excuse me, postal service, led by a man named Richard Fairbanks, who just said, hey, Massachusetts, could I, like, take mail delivered from England and distribute it to people? He was based out of Boston, and he took letters off of ships, distributed them, and then if people wanted to write back home to friends in England, they would give him letters, he'd get them onto the ships, and then send them back. So early on, you could communicate, and the postal system was important because you couldn't communicate with loved ones without it. There was, of course, no phone, no internet, those kinds of things. Well, America became a little bit more serious about 100 years later. Um, ben Franklin, pictured here in the top right, did a lot of different things in America, but he was named the first postmaster general in charge of the postal service and he organized a working postal system which forbid the reading of mail or delaying mail he set some standards for it developed a lot of roads that were used for a wide variety of reasons and their slogan they used early on was RFD notice here in this picture it says RFD down here RFD rural Free delivery. Rural is the countryside. Free, no cost. And, of course, delivering the mail to people. It's a great system. And by 1789, Franklin had 75 post offices. They delivered mail at that point by ships and by stagecoaches. And later on, of course, railroad would get involved in the delivery. But it really helped to bring America together. But as America grew, we got all the way to California, of course. Now, this was going to be a real change. How on earth will we get mail from the East Coast all the way to the West Coast? So they created this system called the Pony Express. The Pony Express began in 1860, April 30th, and sent mail all the way to California from right here in Missouri. America was pretty developed up, up to this area, got the mail here, and then sent the mail all the way to California by horseback. Riders um, carried mail on horseback from Missouri to California. A rider would go about 75 ma miles before handing the mail off to another carrier. However, they would change horses about every 15 miles. So that that kind of rapid pace, they had to be careful with the horses. Um, it would usually take about 8 to 10 days for mail to go all the way from Missouri to California. However, the Pony Express only lasts about a year and a half. It doesn't last very long. Why? Because we always see new technology replacing old technology. And we had new technology to replace the Pony Express. And that was this system created by Samuel F.B. Morse. And he creates the telegraph. This contraption right here, you tap down right here, it sends a pulse right here that's attached to a wire. The wire is then connected to other towns, communities, at some point all the way to California, and a little bit later on, all the way across the Pacific Ocean and Atlantic Ocean to Europe. How does Morse code work? Different taps and different signals. Notice a dot and a dash, or a small dash and three dots, all mean different things, and they could send these currents up and down to people. It allowed for immediate communication. Again, created by Samuel F.B. Morse, quite an invention created by this man. And then that's, so that's kind of the growth of communication at this point. But then we had a growth of, of industry and factories, and a factory was when you would gather many workers in one place. Instead of people working from home, they now are working in one place together. There's a lot of pros and cons with that that we'll look at in a minute. But one thing that really helped the factory system to work was development of the sewing machine, where you could massively create clothing. Um, instead of doing it by hand, you could use this machine. And, and the, the needle here would go down, pull a thread up through your clothing, down and up, down and up. This here was a hand crank, so you use one hand to guide, 
the other hand to crank the wheel around. The very first sewing machines created by two men, Elias Howe and Walter Hunt, brought in this, this new system that would really have a, a big impact on the factory um, system and really aid its growth. It cut the time down to sew garments um, drastically. But then this man, Isaac Singer, you can still buy a Singer sewing machine today. He took this, expanded it some, and his big contribution was this pedal right here. This pedal allowed you to sew hands-free. No more crank, so you can now use both hands to guide the garment through the machine. Pretty revolutionary at this point in history. A few guys I want to, I want to mention... Um, our first of all, Samuel Slater, up here in the top left-hand corner. He came to America from Great Britain to introduce new machinery to the young nation. He would develop his own machinery and yarn plant. Because, of course, cotton is big business, folks. We're growing so much cotton in the South. Actually, seven-eighths of all American exports by 1850 is cotton. So we need to find this way to kind of... Um, make it usable. And of course he would take that cotton and turn it into yarn. He provided jobs for a lot of unskilled labor, including little children for years to come. This man on the right, Eli Whitney, had a couple big inventions. This one here, first of all, um, is the idea of interchangeable parts. What do you mean? Up until this time, if you had a part that was missing, you had to go to a blacksmith to have him make one for you. Whitney said there's got to be an easier way. So he specifically worked with guns to make all of these parts here that would be um, kind of mass produced in molds so that when you needed a replacement part, you could go to the grocery store, well, not grocery store, but the mercantile, and find that missing piece. Instead of having to go to a blacksmith to make that. They could be assembled by um, less skilled workers, large quantities, and that, of course, made them cheaper. It's going to really help the factory system expand as well by doing using interchangeable parts. And then a third person, real quick, is Francis Cabot Lowell. Cabot Lowell is based out of New England, and he organized a mill town for girls. Pictured right here in Waltham, Massachusetts, this mill town brought young people together. When we say young girls, we mean probably like 12 to 15, 16 years old. They lived in dorms under strict supervision, got a little bit of money, and they worked. They worked making clothing, making cheap clothing. It was a way to provide jobs and also to mass produce clothes. So all of these factories, of course, came with some positive and Let's look real quick at some of, the, some of each of them. Positives were, of this era, new inventions made work easier for many people. Less skill. People moved from farms to cities. A lot of jobs were available in the cities. Money earned in factories enabled many to enjoy a higher standard of living. Factories located near waterways, so towns began to grow up around waterways. As a lot of immigrants came to America, provided a lot of work for them. Some of the negatives were, though, you're working six days a week, 75 hours a week. Folks, typically a full-time job is 40 hours a week. This is 75. Wages were very low. A lot of children forced to work in order to survive. Factories were stuffed, cramped, noisy, machines, not have safety devices, a lot of injuries, and for a lot of children, education gets sacrificed because they had to work to help out the family. I know this video here is packed with information, a lot to digest, but all of which is changing American life in the 1800s.